This is a printing press uh, from, uh, what, what's, what's the date of manufacture on this one? Well, Gutenberg uh, certainly did not print on a press that looked like this, but the basic mechanism uh, did not change all that much from Gutenberg's day all the way up to the middle of the 19th century, which is about when this press was made. Um, essentially, the principles of operation are the same. Here's the uh, type that I was talking about, which has been arranged into uh, a particular text, and uh, this type also has accompanying it actually, a reproduction, a photo engraving of uh, what was originally a wood engraving. Uh, here we have uh, an image in relief with the type, which is also in relief, and all of these elements are locked up into the chase, as I noted, which is this rectangular frame that holds everything tightly together, keeps the letters from moving around. And then uh, in this uh, very simple frame-like mechanism, a blank sheet of paper would have been placed, like so, against some uh, guides, or actually punched onto some uh, points that stuck, that stuck through uh, the back of this uh, frame-like uh, mechanism. This is known as the tympan. Here's where the blank paper goes. Uh, then folded down on top of it, a, another frame known as a frisket, which was simply a piece of paper covering a metal frame into which was cut a window, only slightly larger than the image that was to be uh, imprinted onto the paper. So paper goes on the tympan, the frisket is folded down with its window cut into the surface. Um, the partner of the pressman would then ink up the type using what were known as ink balls, Ink balls? Ink balls. These have never been used, which is why uh, they still look uh, like they did when we got them from the manufacturer. But imagine these surfaces entirely covered with black ink. Um, so ink balls are made out of leather. They cover some kind of uh, like a, a wool hair um, uh, uh, material underneath. So these are soft. Soft. My kids would enjoy these things. Yes. And then they would just take these and, and apply the ink to the by rocking back and forth. I... That's right. You would uh, go over the surface very quickly, and uh, Pressman became very very skilled at applying ink. You know, these kind of remind me of those maracas. Uh, the maracas are those whack-a-mole uh, hammers you uh -huh. sometimes see in uh, um, in uh, amusement parks. Anyway, uh, whack-a-mole. Whack-a-mole. Anyway, the uh, the type is now inked up. The tympan and frisket is folded down on top of it. The paper is suspended uh, only millimeters away from the surface of that inked up type. The pressman would then roll the, uh, the, the bed of the press uh, with the type and the paper all together underneath the plan. So here so far everything is exactly as it was in Gutenberg's day. Uh, all of the mechanisms are exactly the same except that most of the pieces were made out of wood, whereas in this 19th century press, we're looking at, uh, at, at cast iron. Uh, the pressman would then pull this bar that you see here, which uh, exerted force against the back or the top of the platen, pushing it down, forcing the paper against the inked up type. Uh, it took quite a bit of force to get a good impression from that type, and the bigger the type mass, or type area, the greater amount of force which was required. In Gutenberg's press, instead of a lever mechanism, which is what is used here, which is a very, very efficient means by which to apply pressure, uh, in Gutenberg's presses, made out of wood, they had a big screw that uh, turned inside of a stationary nut that was mounted to the sides or the cheeks of the press. The bar, instead of being attached to the side of the frame, was directly attached to the screw, so that when the bar was pulled, the screw would turn inside of that nut and descend ever so slightly, forcing the, uh, the, uh, the platen against the type. Then the whole mechanism was uh, rolled or pulled out again, the tympan and frisket frame opened, and a printed sheet um, 
would come off that uh, in this case looked like. And this sheet what was actually printed from that yes. from that form there. That's right. So what you're looking at is the actual thing. Well, I think that's a great explanation of how printing was done for how many almost four centuries. Yes, it's uh, quite remarkable that uh, that uh, particularly in terms of uh, typecasting technology that nobody thought of a better way of making type from Gutenberg's day in the middle of the 15th century all the way up to almost the end of the 19th century. It was only in that period, uh, in the 1880s, uh, that, uh, that inventors perfected a process for composing type and casting type in an entirely different way than had been the case. So here's a, here's a remarkable example of a technology, an important technology, surviving virtually unchanged for, uh, for over four centuries. Uh, truly amazing. And when you think of, of how successful this was, um, I'm always reminded of the fact that in the 45 years or so between the time when the Gutenberg Bible was printed, the finished, the finished printing about 1455, to the end of the 15th century, 45 years, we know for a fact that about 20 million books were printed. 20 million books? 20 million books. Uh, an amazing achievement and one which of course, must have had a remarkable effect on society in that period, whereas before you had books which might take weeks, months, years to make, you now uh, had a process whereby it was possible to make anywhere from two to 500 copies of a book in an edition in a relatively short time.